Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third guest speaker program of the fall semester and the first with a member of our Board of Visitors, um, John S. Gibson. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Board of Visitors, it's a group of uh, distinguished lawyers and other people from the community who help our dean advance the goals of the school. Um, today's speaker, uh, John Gibson, grew up far from here in the state of Michigan, where he was a, uh, in high school, a star student and a star basketball player, then went on to Harvard and then to Michigan Law School, and then eventually found his way to uh, California, where he lives now not very far from the law school. John has um, worked uh, both as an in-house lawyer and for uh, three um, major law firms now with uh, DLA Piper, one of the, not just one of the nation's law firm, largest law firms, but one of the world's largest law firm with offices around the globe. Um, John has a uh, practice that uh, specializes in uh, complex uh, litigation, uh, focusing on antitrust, intellectual property, and a variety of, uh, of other uh, business-related matters. He also has done a considerable amount of community and uh, pro bono work, um, including once representing uh, an autistic student who needed to have a, uh, have a, uh, have a guide dog. Um, John remains active um, in the community in a, in a variety of ways. And um, uh, one of the things that uh, beyond John's law practice that I uh, find found most interesting was is that when he was in high school, he played on an all-star basketball team with the great Magic Johnson. And with that, I'm just gonna give John the floor. John will speak for a while and uh, you can send questions in on the chat function and we will get to as many of the questions as we can. John, welcome very much to UCI Law. Great, thank you so much, Professor Weinstein. And hello uh, to everyone in the class. I'm really pleased to be here and honored. Um, I wanna first say that these are difficult times, obviously. And I think that the historic and unprecedented challenges that you face as law students today will actually help you become the most effective generation of lawyers ever. And we can talk about what I, why I think that. Uh, but it's really not about me, it's about you. I will start with a quick biographical sketch in a little more detail about my life and career. Uh, but then I wanna quickly turn it uh, to talking about you. And um, I wanna talk about you in terms of your transition to practice, your analysis skills, your advocacy, and your power to change the world. So, and then I also wanna leave plenty of time for questions. So professor, please stop me if I'm getting carried away <clears throat> at any time, or if there are questions that make sense to, to intersperse uh, with what I'm saying. So quickly, my biography, maybe some of the things that are not in the, the biography that uh, is written, I was born in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. And at that time, there were frequent marches in opposition to the Vietnam War and uh, racial injustice issues. And I grew up the parents of um, uh, two black Americans who grew up and spent actually most of their life in the officially segregated America the two Americas that you have studied in history books. Um, I lived that in my early childhood. And so uh, I was impressed with the change that folks were trying to make in America and throughout the world. And I was particularly impressed with some of the changes that lawyers um, of all different kinds uh, were, were using their legal skills to try to affect. And in addition to that, I had two other early passions. As Professor mentioned, basketball was one of them. And the other one was government. Uh, growing up in, in those turbulent times, uh, I was really interested in finding out how society could be improved through government and through uh, other means. 
And through both of those passions, you know, I learned that a couple of things make you better. One is practice. <laughs> and the other is learning to anticipate what's around the corner and to see what's coming next and prepare for that before it gets here. So, um, you know, that's kind of my biographical sketch uh, leading up to law school. And so, as the professor said, I played some basketball. I had an early ambition to be a longtime professional basketball player, and it lasted about a few months. So I quickly learned that I wouldn't make a very good living as a professional athlete. And so um, my second choice was um, to do something like law school. I didn't know what a lawyer did, really, other than what I saw on TV. I didn't have any lawyers in the family that I could talk to or, or friends of the family. And so um, I applied to law school, among other things, and got in and, and went and really enjoyed my time there and found that um, the issues of the day were issues that I could really get involved in and that I could use the skills that I developed um, uh, to perhaps make a change in the world. So um, after law school, I clerked for a federal district judge in Michigan uh, and learned quite a lot about litigation and trial work. And um, then I spent about eight months uh, going back. My, I was married at the time and uh, still married <laughs> to the same woman. And um, uh, she, was a doc she is a doctor and was doing her medical residency uh, her one year in Philadelphia where she was born and raised. And so we had our first child born during that year. So I took the better part of that year and was the stay at home parent, which was a fabulous experience. Um, and then after she finished that year, we packed up and drove out to California uh, where I started in a large corporate law firm and she started uh, the rest of her medical um, residency and her practice. Uh, here in Southern California. So I've been practicing in large law firms for about 25, 26 years. I spent four years as an in-house lawyer and a vice president of a, of a company uh, and have had a fabulous career. I think I started out in law, uh, going to law school, thinking I would spend maybe a few years in the big law firms and then quickly become a civil rights lawyer with an organization. And instead, what I found is that I really enjoyed the work that I was doing at these large law firms and the clients I was representing, and that I was getting an opportunity to make a difference and to champion some uh, social justice causes through both my pro bono work, but also some of my um, client billable paying work. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so let's talk about the transition to practice. And in telling you about my transition to practice, I hope it will inform your transition to practice. What I found uh, through trial and error, and wish I had known originally, is that the best way to be effective as a lawyer is to be your best authentic self. And that's to bring your voice to everything you do, your lawyering and your life. Um, I, I think that, so the professor mentioned that I'm on the board of visitors of UCI Law School. I've also been very involved in a number of different ways with the law school over the years. And I've, uh, been colleagues with graduates of the law school. And I can tell you that, you know, to me, the promise of UCI law is that the faculty and the students blend this brilliant scholarship with a commitment and a longing to make a positive change in the world. And I think you don't always see that combination on full display the way it is at UCI Law 
at other places. And so I'm very, very happy to be involved with the law school for that reason. Um, but I think that my life experience has really informed my voice and you know, bringing my voice to every endeavor. Uh, I've brought my voice and my unique experiences to every case I've ever won. And it's the reason I think that judges and juries believe me when I tell them a narrative. It's the reason that I can make an antitrust business case all about democracy and about ensuring that the law enforces the ideals of equality and freedom in dismissing the claims against my client. And so I would encourage you as you transition from law school to practice that you really pay attention to being your best authentic self, really magnifying your voice and the uniqueness that you bring um, to representing clients and in every situation you're involved in. And in a little bit, we'll talk about some of the actual cases I've worked on and how I've done that. Uh, now, I wanna talk also about your analysis skills that you're obviously learning in Professor Weinstein's class and, and other places in the law school. Um, you brought some of those skills with you when you checked into law school. And um, I'm certain that the admissions committee uh, scoured the planet for you and for you know, folks who have this brilliance and who also are committed to changing the world in a positive way. And so you brought some of that raw talent with you. Uh, in law school, you're learning how to hone those skills. And then as a lawyer, you're going to learn how to put those in practice. Uh, and your clients are going to really depend on you for those skills. Uh, I, I also want to say that the lawyering skills and analysis skills that you're learning uh, will be useful even beyond your lawyering. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, well, let's talk about that right now. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples from my own experience. First, in lawyering, where as a first year lawyer, you can make a difference simply by the way you look at a problem and the way you don't necessarily accept what others may tell you about the facts or about the solution, but try to uh, delve in deeper on your own. So this is a case, uh, and because this is being recorded, I'm not gonna be, use too many client names. I will use a few client names on cases that are widely publicized and, um, and where there's no private information to be concerned about. But I was working on a case five or six years ago where uh, I had a very promising first year lawyer who was really working up the facts and knew all the detail and worked on the day-to-day -day part of the case. And we were preparing a witness who was a CEO of a company. And uh, we spent all day as our first and only opportunity to talk to this witness and prepare him to testify. And for reasons I won't go into, there was no deposition or any other information that we could rely on. So we were learning some of the facts from his mind right there in the interview, interview room. So I told the first year associate, who's very bright, very sharp that I wanted, to, because she was much closer to the facts, I wanted to make sure she felt comfortable asking whatever questions she wanted to ask of the witness because it would help us all and would help the client. So we went through the whole day and I went through kind of the script that the first year lawyer had prepared for me. And um, we prepared the witness. We learned some more information that of course prompted some more questions, which I asked. And as it got to be toward 5.30 in the afternoon, the CEO looks down at his watch a couple times <laughs> and looks back at us. Then he looks at his watch and he sits forward and he says, okay, listen, uh, anything else for me? Which of course is body language for, we're done here. <laughs> let's, let's wrap this up. Unless there was something absolutely critical, I've got to go. <laughs> He didn't say that in words, but that's what his body was saying. And right then, the first year lawyer working with me speaks for the first time that day 
and says, I have a few questions. <laughs> so the CEO client looks at me with this knowing look that said to me <laughs> with no words, really? <laughs> your first year lawyer is gonna now ask me questions at the end of the day, handle this. And, but I knew that this first year lawyer was uh, the right person to ask these questions at this time. And she proceeded to ask some of the very best questions of the day, which elicited further information that we used in preparing this witness for effective trial testimony. So that's just a story um, to let you know as a first year lawyer, as you're transitioning, it's very important to be confident about your analysis skills. You may, by analysis, uh, analyzing the facts and being closer a lot of times than the 30 year practitioner has the ability to be in a particular case, um, you're gonna bring fresh value to that work and so don't be afraid, please, to use your voice and to uh, use your analysis skills that you have learned because uh, you also bring a different perspective. And sometimes that's very important, often critical, to preparing witnesses and winning cases. I'll give you another example that impressed me a few years ago outside of law, but an example of a lawyer uh, a train, you know, trained at law school and trained as a constitutional law professor. And in a minute, you're gonna recognize who I'm talking about. This was a few, few years ago when the um, United States federal government uh, finally obtained what they believed to be actionable intelligence on the whereabouts of bin Laden. And as the raid was being planned, there were a number of folks, and this is all declassified information, there were a number, number of folks you know, involved in the planning and the strategy for the, uh, the raid uh, on the compound where Bin Laden was thought to, uh, to be resident. And um, as the Joint Chiefs and the folks uh, who had military experience uh, were planning the mission and talking about how SEAL Team 6 would carry it off. Uh, one constitutional law professor listened to the whole plan. A constitutional law professor with no military training, no combat experience, um, and as, as he heard the whole, after he heard the whole plan, he made a very simple point and a question. That's a great plan, he said. But listen, what if, something happens to the first helicopter. Those of you who may be too young to know the story of the raid, um, Bin Laden was in a compound, in a house, uh, but there was not very good intelligence and uh, photography of the rooftop where SEAL Team 6 was gonna be helicoptered in and land and begin the raid. And so, you know, the question from this constitutional law professor, which you know by now was President Obama, uh, was we don't have very good photographs. We've got satellite imagery of the rooftop, but we don't know the contours of that roof. We don't know what those folks are gonna find when they land in the middle of the night by helicopter. What if something happens to the helicopter? What do we do then? <laughs> and the military folks who presented the plan essentially said in so many words, good point, <laughs> we'll come back to you. <laughs> right? uh, this heart, you know, this uh, uh, law school trained legal mind had come up with something that no one else had really thought of or thought enough of. And they came back with a plan to have a second helicopter available as part of the raid. And that turned out to be critical because Something did happen to the first helicopter. There was an unseen mesh of barbed wire, low fencing, draped around or fixed around the rooftop. And so as the helicopter landed, it was damaged. Uh, the first helicopter that carried the team. But thankfully, there was a second helicopter uh, so that the team could blow up the first one on their way out, take the second helicopter, complete the mission, 
with no one captured or injured on the American uh, SEAL Team 16. So just another example of how the analysis skills you're learning in law school can really be valuable and uh, are to be cherished and used. Now let's talk about your advocacy. Um, you'll learn as you start to represent clients. I know some of you have already uh, in law school, in clinics and so forth, but you are your client's last best hope. And because of that, it's important to listen well, to understand not only what the client's true objectives are, but what the real facts are, not what you're being told at first blush. Um, you've got to be the voice of your client. Your client is not the one who's going to be speaking, you know, except through testimony, is not going to be the one speaking to the court or to the jury. Um, and sometimes you're also the one speaking to um, the public and customers on behalf of the client. It's important to know, in, order, in, in, a, in addition to being the voice of your client, it's important to understand your audience in the courtroom, the jury, the judge, um, whoever it may be, and establish common ground. I think that uh, one very good example of, well, let me give you a couple of examples of good advocacy, where the chips are down and you as the lawyer, whether you're a first year or a 30th year lawyer, can step in with your analysis skills and your advocacy to turn the tables. So let me give you first an example of a case from a few years ago where um, uh, this involved a uh, corruption case involving a sitting judge, state court judge, who was accused of delivering results in cases based on bribes. And um, so there was a criminal case brought against this judge and the basis of the criminal case was an FBI agent who posed as a corrupt lawyer who was bribing, offering a bribe to the judge to deliver a particular result in this uh, one case. And um, so the government's case in chief goes forward and it's a pretty good case because the star witness is the FBI agent who posed undercover. And it's not just any FBI agent. It is a highly decorated 30 years in the field FBI agent who's been responsible for putting away um, serious criminals and you know, ending drug rings and that kind of thing. A very significant, credible, honorable witness. So the, that witness testifies for the government and I'm sure that the client, the judge uh, accused was sitting there in trial thinking, okay, I'm toast. <laughs> you know, is it, I wonder if it's gonna be 20 years or 25 because I am toast now, even though I didn't do it. Um, and so the lawyer gets up for the judge, the accused criminal defendant, and starts by establishing common ground with the FBI agent, the witness on cross-examination, but really common ground with the jury. And the questioning and answering goes something like this. Um, question, so you believe the truth is important, right? Answer, yes, of course. Question, a lie is not the truth. Can we agree on that? Answer, yes, of course, a lie is not the truth. And in our system of justice question, we support truth and not lies. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would, absolutely. Question, you lied when you posed as an undercover agent, as a, a corrupt lawyer offering a bribe to the defendant, isn't that right? You lied? Answer doesn't matter because <laughs> if the answer is yes, the, you know, the jury is a gas. <laughs> if the answer is no, 
uh, then you spend four or five questions really nailing down the fact that now the FBI agent is lying on the stand. <laughs> so in any event, my understanding is that that case um, pled out and did not go to closing argument. But if it went to closing argument, you can imagine that the criminal defendant's uh, lawyer's opening line might be something like, we can all agree <laughs> that, the, that a lie is not the truth. We can all agree that um, what you're here today to vindicate the truth and not suborn lies and perjury. And that's what our system of justice is all about. And this case, ladies and gentlemen, is based on a lie. So um, that's just an example of how you can use your advocacy skills to turn what looks like certain uh, loss into victory or into at least a fighting chance for your client. In this case, a client who is adamant that he didn't do it. I'll give you another real life uh, example from uh, one of my antitrust cases where uh, I was representing the leading supplier of medical, what's called med surge, medical and surgical supplies to hospitals, surgical gowns, sutures, um, masks that we're all very familiar, all too familiar with nowadays. Um, and the, in one of, there were several cases, but in one of the cases, it was a competitor who was suing under the federal antitrust laws, claiming that um, my client, using its market power as the leading distributor, had offered pricing to hospitals in a way that tended to exclude competition by this specialty suture manufacturer. So the competitor, all they made was sutures. They made 30 kinds of sutures. They made purple sutures. They made blue suture, sutures. They made sutures with reverse twists. And my client um, distributed hundreds of different items that a hospital needs every day and basically one kind of suture. So um, at the summary judgment argument, I listened for about an hour and a half as the plaintiff went first and talked about um, the plaintiff client, the plaintiff company, and how its business model was much better for patients and hospitals, and how they use Federal Express and other means to overnight specialty sutures tailored to the needs of the particular surgeons and doctors and patients. And that my client uh, simply uh, packed up a bunch of items in a truck, uh, including some sutures, and you know was far less efficient. So when it was finally my turn, <laughs> I got up and I told the judge, we, you know, we spent the better part of the morning listen, listening to the business model of the competitor, a business model that failed. And the antitrust laws are not about any individual competitor. They're all about competition. In fact, antitrust cases are always about competition and never about a single competitor. And I went on, went on to explain that um, I had, through discovery and depositions, I had talked to the customers, the buying agents at various hospitals, and what they really wanted is one point of sale and buying. They didn't want to order 30 kinds of specialty sutures. They wanted to place an order once a week for to replace their inventory and that saved them time and money and that's what they needed to render excellent uh, medical services to patients and we won that case on summary judgment in part i think because um, of the advocacy which was based on really getting to know the client and understand um, what the client was trying to do and how the customers perceive the service and the value that they were uh, getting comparatively between what our client was offering and what this particular competitor who was suing was offering. Um, let me say a, a quick word on body language. I'm sure you're being taught a lot of this, but 
I'll just offer one point, and that is uh, we say a lot through words. And as lawyers and law students, uh, we are really, uh, we work hard to choose the right words, both in writing and orally. But there's another means of communication, and that is body language. And I'll just say, uh, give you one tip, and that is, um, I think it's important when you're in, whether you're in court, in trial, whether you're in a deposition, whether you're across the table in a negotiation, uh, whether you're in the room meeting a client for the first time, your body language is gonna be communication that the client or the audience receives. And so you should be aware of what you're communicating, which may not be what you really mean to communicate. And I'll just say, when I get up in court to argue, to this day, after 30 years of practice, I'm still nervous. It's a good nervous, but I'm still nervous. And the way I start to relax and start to find my voice is to use my hands early on. Later, when I get comfortable and I get warmed up, my hands start to, to go. <laughs> and, and usually they help make points more emphatically. Uh, but when I first started in my career, I was kind of stiff and I'd start the first five minutes. Yes, Your Honor, I would like to say, if it may it please the court. And then as I matured and had more experience, I realized I've got to warm up. So I did two things. One, I went back to center myself to prepare in a way that made me comfortable in the past. So for me, as Professor Weinstein was telling you, I found some early success playing basketball. So what I, what I still do is I warm up like I'm about to play a game. Before I do an oral argument, uh, I'm warming up and I'm doing stretches and yoga and um, thinking to myself about what questions may come and what message I want to deliver. And then when I get to the moment, normally if you're doing an oral argument or a trial, you're sitting down waiting while something else is going on. Witness is testifying, another lawyer is arguing. And so when you stand up, you don't have time to stretch. <laughs> you don't have time to, to re-prepare. And so for me, I found it helps to make my hands get started. And moving my hands tells my head and my heart and my emotions, it's game time. It's time to tell what's on your heart. It's time to uh, make a case for your client. And so I would just urge you to find what works for you. And just a little trick I've learned is um, if you get your hands in motion early in the argument, maybe try this at your next moot court, um, it's going to encourage the rest of you to find your center and get going on the argument. Um, finally, I want to talk about a couple more cases that you may have read about and um, an effort that I'm very involved with UCI on with uh, the United Nations. And this is the point about the power you have to change the world. And I've discovered this gradually. Um, and I, you know, I didn't think at first uh, when I chose law school and then when I started practicing law that I would necessarily have the power to change the world. And what I'm finding is that two things. One, I have the power, everyone has the power in their corner of the world to make a positive change, just in the way that they approach people and the way that they use their skills. But the, the second thing is quite to my surprise, cases that were um, earth shattering found me <laughs> I didn't necessarily find the cases. They found me. So um, let me tell you about two cases, and if we have time, we'll talk about the United Nations um, artificial intelligence for good effort. Uh, the professor mentioned a case I had involving autism and a service dog. And let me give you a little bit of a background. Um, so this was a pro bono case that found me. I was asked to be kind of the supervising partner and I got very deeply into the case. But it's a story of a family in the Southland area who um, 
at the time had a, a, a son who had severe autism. And um, they couldn't afford too much. Uh, they, were sending, they were trying to send their child to public school. And one summer they discovered this group called Autism Service Dogs uh, that donated to the family based on other folks' generosity, this service dog to kind of try out for the summer um, in between the school year. And they found that this service dog did wonders. To give you a quick snapshot, before the service dog, this six-year-old child um, had been helping his mom uh, on something in the kitchen, and she turned around for five seconds, and he was gone. One of the problems with children with severe autism is that they tend to elope, that is to wander away um, in a way that you wouldn't nor, you know, ordinarily expect. So they found him alive and okay. Half an hour later, six blocks from home and um, across two busy, uh, high, highly trafficked streets. So it was just a miracle that he was fine. Uh, and so the family, realized they had to do something. They got this service dog, um, donated, and found that the service dog did a couple of things. One, um, it tended to, it could tell when the child was about to elope, and it would start playing with the dog. The dog was about the same weight as the child, it was so cute, and the dog would intercept in a playful manner so that the child would not elope. Um, and the same thing with regard to, um, uh, emotional reactions and tantrums that the child would normally like, would sometimes have, um, the dog would start playing with the child and make them forget uh, why they were upset. So fast forward to the school year, um, the, the family and the child and the service dog show up for the public school in the area, and the school district says, no, <laughs> we are not having a dog on campus in our classroom." We're worried about safety of the other kids. We're worried about disrupting the classroom. Uh, and by the way, we've talked to our lawyer, and the only cases we know of, of where service dogs are allowed in uh, public school districts are um, cases involving seeing eye dogs. And so there's no precedent for this. And they were right. There was no legal precedent for that. Um, but as we got more involved in the case, I became more emotionally determined to make a change, and so did my team. And to make a long story short, uh, we really dug down to understand what uh, this child was facing and how the service dog made a difference and how the service dog might be able to make a positive difference in the classroom and in that school. And um, so we made these arguments, we constructed a, uh, an argument about why, even though there wasn't any law, federal law supporting this, and no federal court had ever ordered a school district to allow an autism service dog into school, that this is what should happen, and that this is what the Americans with Disabilities Act is all about. And uh, so we constructed some models as to why uh, some analogous you know, cases that suggest this should happen. And ultimately, uh, we got a federal judge who um, uh, understood and I think also became uh, very interested in making, in making a difference and ultimately ruled and ordered something that is very rare in American jurisprudence uh, injunctions are not all that rare, but what is rare is a mandatory injunction. Most injunctions prevent a company or a school district from doing something. The one in our case ordered a school district to do something, that is to allow this uh, child with the service dog into school. And um, closing up on that, the, um, a couple of things happened afterwards. The most gratifying thing, I think, two gratifying things. One, uh, the autism service dogs group who had donated the dog did a training 
in advance of the school year for the classroom where the dog was going to be present. And then we did some, some post work just to see how things were going as lawyers. And what we learned is that the very teachers who were afraid and, and opposed the entry of this service dog into their classroom are the same teachers who told us, this dog helps me teach my class. And so I'm not gonna cry this time, but I cried like a baby when I first heard that because here was legal work that we did um, thinking we could be, that it was exciting, that we could help this family, but it's legal work that made a difference not only for the family and the child, but for the teachers and the other pupils in the class and the whole school. Um, and then the second part of that is that uh, my team and I received notes from par parents all around the country who'd heard about the case, thanking us and explaining their situation and how they felt like they never had a legal voice before and that now they had an outlet and an ability uh, to, to do something for their child with autism that could really help. So I, I know that there are gonna be cases like that that find you. I think you can also look for cases like that, uh, but those are cases where you'll be glad you developed your lawyering skills, you used your voice and your analysis that you've learned. Um, I wanna be mindful of the time uh, professor, I had two more things I could cover. One is this case where uh, the former owner of the Clippers uh, was caught making racist statements and then the litigation that followed that. Please go ahead with that one, John. It's very okay. timely, I think. So um, some of you may have been fairly young when this happened. This is, I think, six, maybe six years ago. Um, at that time, the Los Angeles Clippers NBA basketball team was owned by a gentleman named Donald Sterling. And uh, long story short, TMZ published a story and actually played a rec had a recording of this owner making very racist statements, uh, including uh, telling a, a, a telling someone don't bring black people to my Clippers basketball games. <laughs> and so I'm laughing, but I, um, I uh, was very, you know, taken with that at the time. And fortunately, so was the commissioner of the NBA, Adam Silver, who was just, I think, two months on the job, new to the job when this all came out. And to his great credit, um, he acted swiftly and immediately and banned that owner from appearing at the games and managing the team. But what he couldn't do, uh, because this is America where citizens have property rights, he couldn't take away that owner's property rights in the team. So of course that owner still owned the team. So the NBA appointed an interim CEO of the team to manage the team and that interim CEO hired me and my team to see what we could do about divorcing the owner's property interest from the LA Clippers and to do that through litigation. Uh, at the time, the star player for the Clippers was Chris Paul who now and also at that time was, is and was, the president of the NBA Players Association and a person of, um, uh, you know, an, an outstanding player, uh, a player that fans adore, but also a person that carries a lot of clout with the other players and indeed with the NBA. And so it was no secret, well, it's no secret now <laughs> that, uh, Chris and the Players Association and a couple of key players, LeBron James, um, Dirk Nowitzki and others, were planning to boycott the NBA if this owner wasn't removed from ownership by the end of that summer. And so I think this all started in the spring of 2014. Um, so we had a tall task and um, long story much shorter, 
uh, it was a, one of the most interesting cases I've had. One of the cases where I felt very good about the client I was representing, the interim uh, CEO on behalf of the MBA, who was putting his foot down and putting the league's foot down in opposition to racism. You know, one of, to me, it's a great example of anti-racism and saying, because this owner is racist and espouse racist views, we want to cut ties with them. We want the, this team to be owned by somebody we can be proud of and someone who shares our values and the values of the league and the values of the world. And so I'm just very proud that, um, and blessed that the interim uh, CEO uh, and the Players Association and Adam Silver and the league all stood together shoulder to shoulder with me to make this happen and back this up. And along with other lawyers and law firms, we did make it happen through a trial where uh, we don't have time to go through the, the niceties of it, but ultimately a, a state judge, state court judge in Los Angeles issued a finding after trial that allowed us to sell the team to Steve Ballmer, uh, who at that time was the CEO of Microsoft and is just the greatest, you know, the greatest equity holder and, uh, and, and chair of a professional sports team that I know. Um, so it, it was a great opportunity. And uh, in, in doing that and preparing for trial, I remember preparing the potential witnesses, Chris Paul, Doc Rivers, the head coach, uh, and others, and finding out that we had kind of an unofficial time frame or, or limit <laughs> to um, to make this happen, to 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 uh, make sure that a new owner uh, bought the team by the end of the summer, or there was going to be a strike, or I should say, a boycott by at least you know ten or so of the top players in the game, and the idea was who's going to come to an NBA game if the top players, Dirk Nowitzki, uh, LeBron James, Chris Paul at that time, are not playing. So it was a very effective means of, of using their voice to make the message clear. And I think I was just gratified that my team and I had the lawyering skills to carry forward their wishes and our wishes into a victory. So I'll stop there. I know we're coming up to the top of the hour. John, thank you for those inspiring and concrete examples. Um, got about three or four questions. The first one, I want to just take you back to something that you said early on when you were talking about the situation of the long interview with the CEO of the company and it and you know came to the end of the day and the young lawyer. So uh, sort of a two-part question that number one. Could, I think it would be useful to students to, if you could talk a little bit about, um, in whatever order, one, how you actually responded to the CEO's wink and a nod, but even before that, of what it was that that young lawyer did, had done, to imbue you with the confidence that you had in that lawyer. What, 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 did, what, did, what did she done? I gather you said it was a female lawyer. Yes, that's right. Good question. And um, I think I don't want to use her name, but but we had a saying uh, in our practice that um, uh, when someone asked a good piercing question, it was a her name question. <laughs> and so I had had experience with her even before that case, um, even as a summer associate with her asking the question that nobody either wanted to ask or didn't or maybe didn't think of. And so um, she was very good at listening actively to something and then um, digging a little bit deeper. Okay, you say the sky is purple, <laughs> but, um, but I've seen a couple of days where it's blue and I'd like to go further with you on that. And can you tell me a little bit more about why you say the sky is purple? And then ultimately, she digs in with a question here and a question from here and to narrow um, the answers so that she finally gets to the truth. 
So I knew that about her and I knew that um, she would most likely come up with a question or two that I hadn't thought of, or she'd be able to ask it in a way that um, I either didn't think of or couldn't because of my relationship with the CEO. Right. So that, that's the background, very good question. So I was just gonna say also in response to that, your, that your response illustrates one other thing that I think is um, very important for all lawyers, but certainly for young lawyers to learn, is that um, oftentimes on one's watching lawyers on television, you know, it's kind of somebody pulling the rabbit out of the hat. And you used two words in your response that were, I thought, very significant. One was that she was a very active listener. And second, your response manifested that you had engaged yourself in some ego purging to know or to acknowledge that you that she might know more or might think of a question you wouldn't have thought of. I think that's right. And I think you know, part of being a successful lawyer and a winning lawyer is having a great team around you. And I, so this goes back to, I don't want to make everything about sports, but I think that you know, whatever your students have in their li previous lives or their current lives um, that allow them to experience victory, whether it's um, as a musician or an actor or um, as a uh, member of a book club, you know, whatever it is, um, they can draw upon that experience. So for me, I draw upon my competitive sports experience. And I found that uh, when I finally got on a championship team, it wasn't because I was scoring all the points. It's because I finally learned <laughs> that the best way to do it is surround myself with people who are as good or better and feed, play to their strengths. Allow, you know, be the player who allows them to be their best and then the team can be the best because the team a championship team is only as good as its weakest player so make the weakest player the as strong as it can possibly be and maybe the strongest player is very important that's great um question from um someone in the audience is as law students go through the interviewing process with law firms how can they tell which firms have a strong commitment to pro bono? Are there questions that you suggest that a, a law student interviewing a firm, either for a summer position or a full-time firm, that they could ask that would, you know, elicit, you know, informative answers on this topic? Yes. Um, so first thing would be to find out whether, ask whether the firm has a lawyer, an attorney, who, whose full-time job is to administer the pro bono program. And that says a lot. A lot of times, you know, the top firms who do that, DLA Piper, Colin Mooring, a few others, um, have longtime practicing attorneys who finally got the opportunity to uh, practice full time in pro bono. And they can really, they really run those programs and they, you know, have a wealth of experience. Uh, so I think that's one thing. And the second thing is, ask them about some of the matters that they've handled. Are they um, channeling the firm's lawyers into significant cases that will impact social justice? Uh, and what are some of those cases? The interviewer should know if, if uh, the firm is truly committed. And would, would another relevant question potentially be, the way that your the, uh, a lawyer's pro bono time counts for their work time at the firm. That's right. I think that's important um, and uh, another excellent question. Okay. Um, so why don't you? I think you've mentioned a couple of times that we do have a bit of time. And I'm was curious, and I think others are. You made a reference to the United Nations, if I heard you correctly. Yes. Could you talk a bit about that before we conclude? Sure. I'll start by saying that, um, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, as probably your students know better than, than I, is rapidly being brought alongside human intelligence. And as we do that, we've got to make sure that it's for good, <laughs> that it's to make the world better. And it, that it's not to accentuate 
implicit bias or um, and inequalities in society or inequities. So um, UCI law, I think, is very involved in, in wanting to become and, and quickly becoming the world's leading law school on AI. And that's going to mean AI in the classroom. It's going to mean um, academic pursuits and excellence with regard to AI. Uh, and it's really um, Dean Richardson and uh, Senator Joe Dunn uh, and Neil, uh, who is a former scientist at the UN, who's now with uh, UCI, uh, and is one of the foremost minds on uh, engineering minds and AI, really brought me into this effort to chair what's called the law track for the United Nations AI for Good platform. And in essence, it's all about uh, how do we as lawyers think about how to form these new technological ecosystems. In a way, we're starting a brand new world, right, with autonomous vehicles and um, uh, other ways in which artificial intelligence is going to take over portions of our lives and portions of society. And before we do it, we need to come to agreement on how it's going to work and what some of the legal principles are going to be. And lawyers, not only UCI Law School, but you know my committee that I chair, are essential to it because we're trying to bring together governments from all across the world, uh, market participants, large and small tech companies, um, private organizations, uh, to think about and discuss in a meaningful way, making sure we do this the right way, making sure that instead of embedding bias in a new technological ecosystem that works for evil, that we do it for good in a way where we can um, help eliminate world hunger. We can deliver medical services to those who don't have them. And in, even in, in uh, you know, regions in the US and places in the world where it's very difficult to deliver them, those medical services, AI can do it. And of course, what we're facing right now is as we search for the cure for this pandemic, AI can help, is helping, but there are lots of ethical questions and difficult questions about once AI helps us find the cure and we surrender personal biological data to help AI figure it out, what are gonna be the consequences down the line and what can we do right now? So it's really all about coming together as a world, um, academic, academicians, practitioners, uh, lawyers, uh, government officials, to make a better world, employing AI. Well, John, I want to thank you very much for sharing your time, insights, experience, and uh, to wish you good luck in your endeavors. And in, that latter endeavor sounds like a really, really major deal. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us, and, uh, and uh, good luck going forward. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Professor, and thank you to your class, and good luck to all of you. Thank you.